That little story, by the way, is a story by Alice Walker. You know the famous African-American author who wrote uh, The Color Purple. And she wrote a story called Meridian, in which this little girl is shunned by her mother because simply she's too busy. And why did I sprinkle you this morning? And had some fun with it. Because we need to remember, not just through the ear gate or, or through the eye gate, but feeling it. When you feel that water, you oh, we don't do this every Sunday. It's different. It wakes me up. It makes me think, what's that crazy pastor up to? <laughs> Throwing water and then making sure the choir gets extra water and all kinds of stuff. All right. The girl eventually forgets all about the goal. And the reason the church, in its wisdom, has the thanksgiving for baptism and aspergus, where you get sprayed with water, is because it's very important not to end up like the little girl who buried her gold, see? She buried it. And eventually she forgot about it. And it happens to us. Uh, all of us forget it from time to time. And when we do that, unfortunately, we tame baptism. And we forget to use the gifts that are given in baptism. You know, Lutherans and Episcopalians, right along with the Orthodox and Catholic, we believe in baptism. God does something. It's not simply a nice little ceremony where, you know, Grandma gets out a uh, beautiful old baptismal gown that her great-grandmother wore, and the little baby puts it on, and it's beautiful. Uh, but it looks so much like a, a nice ceremony. Dad stays home that day to mix the drinks for the party afterward, which is really the goal of the day for him. But it's nice, a little ceremony where, you know, we can have a smile. Everybody's happy and there's a candle lit and let's get over it now and get to the dinner. No, uh, baptism is a holy sacrament. And we don't do anything, nothing. How many children have you seen up here who can't speak yet? They're not thinking about Jesus while they're getting baptized. They will eventually because the Spirit is granted to them in that holy sacrament. And in the Western culture, I've seen this all my life, it's very easy to sort of relegate anything that's mysterious to falsehood. No, that's just not true. That's an act of hubris, by the way. Even my scientific friends say there are things they cannot explain and so they don't tame it down. They say it's, it's open. It's all open for inquiry, see, for questions. Um, no, baptism is not fire insurance. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Some people told me that, and I, I know I get it. That's what they're thinking, that, uh, well, you better get baptized because without it, you're going, you know, to that other place. So let's get some insurance, you know. Baptism is getting your goals in life from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus. Baptism is the framework from which we live a completely uh, different life than many of the values of this world. It's not a small thing. It'll come into contradiction with some of your neighbors because you'll do crazy things and marvelous things with the Holy Spirit working in you, see? Um, and, and let's not relegate it to just a cute little ceremony that it takes another 17 minutes in church and the ball game's on and, you know, all that stuff. It is a powerful, sacred event. And we're along for the ride, and it's a marvelous ride. And it's a ride that gets us involved in the life of the world, not just our own life, see? The phone rings, don't answer it. <laughs> you might get involved, see? The little girl takes her thumb out of her mouth, don't listen to her because you might get involved in her life, see? Your neighbor going through an awful marital dispute, don't go over there. <laughs> you might get involved. You might not be liked, but you could give all kinds of love and understanding, see? It's open. Um, one of my colleagues used to say, that every baptismal font should have a warning sign in front of it that says, warning, baptism is dangerous to your health. 
so much for the nice little ceremony idea. <laughs> it does have ceremonial aspects, and they're marvelous. I love them. But it is a death and resurrection. Or as St. Paul says, uh, I got it memorized, Romans 6. Do you not remember, Christian, when you were baptized? You were baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. So that just as Jesus was raised, so you will live a new life. A brand new life. They'll come at odds to some people. So, Zach was my, almost one of my favorite confirmands many, many years ago. And I shouldn't say I had a favorite confirmand. He was amazing. Smart, beautiful smile. He uh, engaged with everybody. Um, even, even boys his age would, would wait and fight to wheel him into his classroom because he was in a wheelchair, see? He was born with spina bifida. And he was in my parish. And uh, when he got to confirmation age, I really got to know him because he engaged through the little hole in his throat here, talking, and when he talked, Everybody quieted down because it took a long time for him to say something. And every confirmation night, I would go home with my heart full of joy to watch the kids eighth grade. Now, that's, that can be a snarky age, really, and it is for many people. But when Zach wheeled himself into the room, everybody went over, the girls, boys, gave him a hug, he would smile, and we'd start, I'd say, okay, we got to start the class now, that's enough hugging, um, but no, boys in high school would fight to see, can, which room is he going to next, I'm going to take him there and back, another kid would say, no, it's my turn, I mean, just this marvelous kid with spina bifida, which, as you know, uh, does tremendous damage to your motor skills, and so he had to be in a wheelchair, I asked him once, uh, Zach, do you ever remember not being in a wheelchair? He said, no, I don't remember that. I know it's true when I was an infant and really small, but I can't remember back that, that far. He's always been in one. Okay, when, when Zach was a little kid, eight years old, in third grade, his parents got a phone call from a lady named Dolores. Tammy and Terry were his parents. Terry was a cop in town. Tammy worked at the community college in the office. Delightful people. And uh, Terry, <laughs> as a cop, you know, as a police officer, you gotta be careful with phone calls. And so he was uh, always a bit suspicious and very careful on the phone. And this woman calls and she says, is this Terry, the father of Zach? And he said, yes, who wants to know? You know, he's a police officer. And she said, oh, I'm a caretaker for Kimberly and Don uh, up at their beautiful lake home. And uh, I was asked by Kimberly to look you up. She remembers when Zach was baptized at church, but they had been living in Arizona and uh, renting out their place. And she said, she remembered your family. And she wanted me to track you down and ask you a question. What question? Terry says. Now, Tammy is the opposite personality of Terry, and she lets him know it regularly. She said, why are you so mean on the phone? And he said, yeah, it's one of these, I don't know, we haven't got time for this. She said, time for what? He said, I don't know, get on the other phone. Well, she gets on the phone, and Dolores says, <clears throat> Kimberly and Don, as you know, or you might remember, uh, have a lake place, and Don died just a month ago. Don, at the age of 14, was in a car accident, and he himself was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And he and Kimberly had this marvelous marriage. She loved him dearly. He loved her. And uh, Terry said, well, what's, what's this about? And she said, well, uh, Don's van is still up at the lake, and I'm sure that Kimberly will probably give you a good deal on it. And Terry says, nope. Now, let's understand, Terry. You know, those of you who have been involved in debilitating diseases in your family, you can have all the spaghetti dinners you want and all the beer and brats that the church puts on, and you still never get ahead of your bills, medical bills in this country. 
And so we can understand Terry's reluctance here. And he says, you know what, you know, I, thank you, all the do-gooders, it's great. And, I, and believe me, I really appreciate it, but we're so far behind. We don't have money for this. And, and Dolores said, well, just do me a favor. She really wants you to come out and look at it. And she sets the date, and Tammy says, we'll go <laughs> from the other line. And she looks at Terry like, stop it. You know. <laughs> so they drive up there to the lake place. Beautiful driveway in, huge lake home. And there was the van in the driveway, almost new looking. And Terry, for a moment, gets rid of a little of his reluctance. He's thinking about his son, Zach, who he loves dearly. And he drives right up behind it before he, he says, I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to see that van. And he looks around. He's gorgeous and all the handicap accessible uh, features in it, see. And he's got a little car and he has to, you know, fold up Zach's wheelchair and put it in that car. And he thinks, this would be nice. And suddenly, both Tammy and, and uh, Terry hear Dolores down at the beach. Down here, Tammy, Terry, come down here. So they walk down to the beach and she's at the railing, not even looking at them. And they uh, crowd up behind her and she says, isn't it beautiful? And he said, well, it's, it's not that beautiful. You know, he's thinking of a good deal on the van. And she said, I'm talking about the van. I'm talking about the lake, the trees, the water, the birds. Isn't it marvelous what God has done? Terry wasn't ready for that. Tammy says, it is. It's beautiful. And Terry says, well, about the van, she said. And just think, Kimberly and Don came out here every morning in the summer back in the day. She made breakfast for him, his favorite eggs. She kissed him. I was here three days a week. I saw the whole thing. And they started, you know what they started with Terry? <laughs> Terry is befuddled. <laughs> He's looking at his watch. They started with prayer. And they'd take turns. She'd pray the grace one morning. And it was a prayer of great gratitude to God. I learned so much from Kimberly. And Don, I really miss him. And he said, but about the van. And then she said, he would, he would want to go fishing. And I remember the day they got that pontoon. You see that pontoon over there? Fully handicap accessible. And believe it or not, Terry, he could drive that in his condition. They figured out mechanical devices. He was like a little kid in a candy store in that pontoon boat. And he said, I know, but we're talking, we're talking, we're talking about the van. She said, oh, yeah, the van. Oh, well, okay, we'll go up and uh, we'll call Kimberly because she wants to talk to you about that. I don't have authority to talk to you about that. Now they're walking up to this beautiful, everything's ramped in so that Don could get into the uh, house easily. They're, they walk into the kitchen. There's all kinds of uh, ways for a handicapped person to be able to cook. Beautiful things. And uh, while they're standing there, uh, Dolores calls Kimberly and she says, oh, they're right here, Kimberly. Terry, would you like to take this? Tammy, you can go on the other phone if you like as well. Kimberly says, you are Terry, Zach's father. Yes. And I, I've, I've looked at the van. She said, I remember when he, he was baptized and then we've been gone so much in Arizona and so on. But uh, I know he's got spina bifida and Terry said, what's the cost on the van? She says, oh, take the van. And Terry didn't know what to say. And Tammy says, well, take it. <laughs> Tammy could receive grace. You know that grace is hard to receive. We talked about this in Bible study. It's this most beautiful, unmerited gift in the world. You think we'd be overjoyed. But sometimes we have a hard time accepting grace. You know it. Somebody gives you a marvelous Christmas present. You haven't seen them in years. And what's the first thing you do? What am I going to give back? What, what's in the house that I can, what do I need to buy? Grace is free and joyful and hilarious. All you need to do is dance with it and enjoy it, see? And Tammy could do that, but not Terry. He said, free? And she said, yes. Maybe you forgot a Bible verse. I love this. This very gracious woman who's school marming him with love. She said, did you forget that Bible verse? Freely God has given, freely we shall 
give. And he said, but, I, I, but she said, just take the van and be quiet. <laughs> then she says, does Zach like to fish? And Terry starts thinking now. I mean, he's been hit with a two by four, this grace business, see, and Bible verses and prayer and all this stuff. And, and he says, yes, he does. And Terry's thinking about how he's cradling his son's body in this little duck boat and they have fun together, but he knows that Zach's gonna get heavier over the years. And she said, did you notice that it was handicapped accessible, Terry? He said, I did. She said, take the boat. He says, for, and she says, don't say it. <laughs> don't say for free, or I'll give you that Bible verse again. She says, I'll do it anyway. Freely, God has given us freely we shall give. And I wonder if anybody here knows what the third thing is that happened. She said, do you like the house? Take it. And Terry did not say a word. <laughs> Terry says, we will, through tears of joy. And finally, Terry broke down. I mean, he was like a puddle. This is what the baptismal life is about. Kimberly remembered who she was. Living an alternate lifestyle, Christ lifestyle, in a world that measures everything by meritocracy, everything by what you earn. Terry and Tammy and Zach are graced three times that day. And they did move in. That's where they lived. And Kimberly was entirely joyful about the whole thing. Up till the time Jesus was baptized, it was relatively, uh, he was relatively unknown. Ah, a few stories, you know, he, his birth at Christmas, his flight into Egypt as a refugee. Uh, then he uh, has a little, there's a circumcision and a naming ceremony. And then the only other story, he's 12 years old and what happens? His parents lose him in the temple. Uh, three stories. And then he turns 30 and he makes a decision, and maybe he was struggling with it, I don't know, uh, to get in on God's dream and God's purpose for his life, his work in this world. And he must have thought, this is the last night I'm sleeping in my own bed, and it was. He left Mary and her pots and pans. He left Joseph and his woodworking tools. He left his siblings. By the way, he had at least one sister and several brothers. He left it all, and he went from that podunk area, Galilee, hill country, and the little town of Nazareth, uh, with the smoke of the fires of that community still in his hair, and he went down to see John the Baptist, this crazy guy with camel skin and all this stuff, and he got baptized, and what happens? The sky opens, the earth shakes, and he hears these marvelous words of love. You are my son, and you I am well pleased. That's what we all need to hear every day. That's the gospel, see? And it propelled Jesus into his life's work. He got involved completely in our lives. And it cost him. Uh, it, it brings incredible joy and purpose, but it also costs something. Let's not be fooled. But here's the courageous question. Is living out your baptism the way Jesus did worth it with all the pain? And you know what Jesus would say every single time? Yes, yes, yes. Worth it. It's always worth it, see. Uh, do you remember either your own baptism, uh, if you were old enough, or someone else's were... Uh, in the liturgy, rightly, I love this, the pastor turns to the baptized one or to that baptized family, sponsors, godparent, and says, do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? It's not a nice little ceremony with a nice dress. Do you renounce Satan? Uh, in the Orthodox Church, you know what they do there? They turn and spit right on the floor. They spit on Satan. All of them. Should we do that here? Should we try that practice? Get a, someone's got a spittoon or something. Number two. 
do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? And everyone says, I do. What's the third one? Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I do. We've got to get away from this idea that uh, baptism is simply an initiation. It is, but it's more than an initiation, like you join the Elks Club or something. I, I love the Elks. I was an Elk. But it's not a club. It's not a simple initiation. It is a death and resurrection. It is a change of life into Christ's life. And of course, you never do it perfectly. Okay, you say the three things. I renounce them. I renounce them. I renounce them. Then the pastor says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or you get dunked in certain traditions. That's good too. Um, and then a candle is given. I said this on Christmas Day. Do you remember what the pastor or the president of the council said when that candle was lifted? You are a child of God. You belong to Christ. And the pastor puts a little oil on her finger, puts the thumb on the forehead of the baptized and said, child of God, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. It's a sacrament. It's a sacred act. And from that, we become sacraments of God's love for others. Now, we might not be like Kimberly and have a million dollar lake home, but we might. And we will find other ways to utilize the gifts that we have. Uh, you know, I've, I've, and, I, and I say this about every third Sunday, because I love this part of Luther. You know, the Christian lives in two people. Uh, she lives in Christ through faith, and she lives in her neighbor through love. Thank you, Kimberly, for your modeling of the baptismal life. Amen.